this is going to be, I guess right near the very end, we're going to try to crank out three different events. We're going to have this one. Next week, we're going to have one on uh, video games and physics, something like that. And then um, the following week, we're going to have a movie night. I guess Eric's not here. But I hear it's going to be Slumdog Millionaire. Maybe with Indian food. Great. Um, anyway, and then if you guys have any ideas for stuff over the summer, yeah. I think we're pretty fair game. Like, right? Can you get pizza? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That, that All right, so I guess without further ado, we're going to start. And we're actually recording this, so just, it'll be gone the, on the website, hopefully. And uh, with the mic's not working, right? Yeah, you just. The mic's working all right. Oh, yeah. oh it's, it's working all right. So, and then our moderator is going to be Katie. So, there you go. Okay, well, for those who don't know me, I'm Katie Mayer, and I'm happy to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Art Gottschalk from the Shepherd School. He is the Chair of Composition and Theory Departments over at Shepherd. He received his doctorate in Music Composition from the University of Michigan. Um, he has had a long, illustrious career where he's seen pretty much every aspect of the music field. Um, earlier on in his career, he had a successful music production company. Later, he turned his focus to composition, and now education as a professor at Shepherd. Uh, his catalog has over 100 compositions that have been performed and recorded around the world. His works range from orchestral pieces, chamber pieces, uh, around 20 film and TV scores. Uh, and he has a prestigious award from the National Academy of Arts and Letters, which is the Charles Ives Prize. So quite the impressive resume. We're very happy to have him for our panel on music, physics, and technology. Um, here at Rice, he's taught courses ranging from theory, composition, uh, electronic music, counterpoint, including uh, seminars on music technology and music law. So we're very happy to have him here. Um, thanks to Chris and Dan for organizing and to the Shell Foundation for funding our uh, panel series. And let's give our speaker a warm welcome. I don't know if I can sit in this chair, <laughs> but I can, I can stand at the lectern. I have some experience doing that. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay. As I, as I told uh, other people before I came, it's kind of late notice for me, and I've been traveling a lot. When I, when I uh, first heard about this, I was in New York, and I wasn't even near my calendar back in the office. I couldn't tell whether I could even make the date. It turned out I had a lunch engagement. It was canceled for a day so I could be here, but what I couldn't do is prepare any fancy PowerPoint presentations or such. And frankly, I come from an era where uh, such things are still relatively new. It's a big deal for me to do a PowerPoint presentation. I'm more of a chalk dust on the pants leg type of guy. Uh, but on top of not preparing any fancy PowerPoint presentation, I really didn't prepare anything. <laughs> that doesn't stop me from talking, though. I'm a professional college professor. Uh, <laughs> We talk for a living, we give answers even if we don't know them. We have, we have a, a way of looking uh, profound and sincere and, and all of those things. And, and you're all PhD students, so many of you, of course, will end up in the same uh, predicament. Uh, so, so this could be very open, and you can ask as many questions as you want. I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything. I actually, I, I, I have been a jack of all trades and a master of none. In addition to the to the things that she said, I, I have also I was first brought to Rice actually to teach physical acoustics and develop the electronic uh, and computer laboratories, uh, which which are now run by a colleague of mine, Kurt Stallman. Uh, I, I worked in uh, architectural acoustics uh, as an acoustical consultant at the faculty clubs redo. Uh, oh, I forget what we call it, the Half Life Hall over here. Okay. Uh, Pardon me, not Duncan, behind Duncan, where they had the linear accelerator, where they had the, uh, the accelerator for a while. Uh, anyway, um, I had to redo that. A number of buildings here on campus and elsewhere. So I've, I've really had a chance to dabble in things. And the reason for that is just because uh, I'm just terribly interested in anything that has to do with sound, music, e even so far as I still work in music business and law, I work as, a, as an intellectual property uh, expert witness in, in copyright cases. My most recent client was Jimmy Buffett. And uh, during that encounter, uh, I learned that the reason Jimmy Buffett is a billionaire, uh, unlike most musicians who make their money and lose it, is because his uncle is Warren Buffett. You know, we never put two or two together. He's got a really good money manager. <laughs> so, uh, uh, so I can't hold forth on just about any topic that may or may not be of interest to you. 
but to get things started, uh, I like to start at the beginning. And when I say the beginning, I mean really the beginning. Um, I'm very fortunate that a friend of mine in town is a, is a, a, a polymath and an autodidact. Started out in physics, but he's now a painter and a sculptor, about 82 years old. And a number of his name is David Attix. You probably have seen some of his work. He did that, that, that cello that's downtown. Uh, if you've ever been to Galveston in the Strand, there's a giant concrete corner. He does, he's kind of famous for doing presidential busts that are 40 feet tall and stuff. Not such a good sculptor, but a great painter. Uh, anyway, he introduced me to James Missioner years ago when, when uh, Jim lived in Austin. And uh, uh, you know, he's a very successful author. And, and James always wrote big, thick books about large subjects like the Caribbean or the Chesapeake Bay or Mexico. And people always like to joke that he always started like with the amoeba. You know, and then the amoeba evolved and so on, and then eventually he gets around to talking about some people that are the descendants of that amoeba and how they settled the land and so on. So when I say I like to start at the beginning, I really do like to start at the beginning. To think about sound, I mean, we like music. I lied, I'm gonna sit on this thing. We like music. Uh, I think most people have a predilection towards music. Some of us have had more opportunities than other. Uh, very few people, or amusical, that is, can't hear it, can't understand it, uh, other than those that are profoundly deaf. The old notion of tone deaf is actually kind of uh, antiquated also. But we all respond to music in one way or another, and one of the things that's, that's always uh, uh, concerned me is, is why. And in order to find why, I go back to the beginning. Um, you know the expression, uh, on, uh, ontogeny recapitulates philogeny, right? You've all heard that, because it sounds so good. When a PhD student, a PhD student says things like that, uh, it makes your parents feel proud that they spent the money <laughs> on their education. But of course it means that the, the development of the organism in utero oftentimes reflects the evolution of the species. And if you look at uh, a human, um, the sense of hearing develops pretty early and uh, about two months. And so that means that there's a good seven months, if my math is accurate, where uh, the developing fetus can hear sounds. And the, anything that's gonna occur that early in the development is gonna have some profound impacts. Uh, you have to ask yourself, of course, then, well, what sounds? Well, uh, luckily, there are people that work in those fields and test those things, and the, the two most prominent sounds that the uh, developing fetus here is, is the high-pitched whine of the human nervous system, the mothers, and the, uh, of course, the, the lower-pitched sounds and the regular repeating rhythms uh, from the vascular system and from the, and especially the heart. Uh, also, sounds from the external world filtered through the amniotic fluid. Uh, so this idea of playing Mozart for your baby while it's uh, still inside is maybe not a bad idea if we accept the premise that playing Mozart is, is beneficial for you. In the long run. I, I kind of think it is, but maybe not for the reasons the pundits say. Uh, 